And I think that the budget problem is going to be the number one problem that's going to be facing the legislature and whoever is governor for the next two years. I think the next governor might have to raise taxes? I don't know. I don't know exactly what the uh, final deficit figures will be. Uh, it depends on that. Our income has been increasing in certain areas, such as sales tax. If the income tax figures would increase, then there may not be any necessity. But this, of course, you won't be able to determine until we get those final figures. It is a possibility. I would say there's a possibility. I hope that it doesn't have to happen. Well, those who uh, uh, advocate civil disobedience normally also uh, admit that they must be prepared to accept the legal consequences of their acts. Uh, there are others who feel that we should abide by all laws and then use the democratic processes that are open to us to bring about a correction of those laws which are either now obsolete or are unjust. And in a purely personal way, not speaking for the Commission, but for myself, I very much hold at the moment to the latter view. I hope that it doesn't last. I think that. Uh if we're going to win the election in November, it can't last. Our votes could go to a fourth party person like McCarthy. Uh, if this person does not appear, and if there's not a strong fourth party movement, we will probably be urging people not to vote. Don't vote for president. From a very practical, parochial point of view, uh, the governor's office has to be at full strength and with 100 percent operation at the time the General Assembly is in session from the 17th of January to well into April. Uh, that's not the case now. Right now is the real slow period for uh, gubernatorial activities. And when you take into consideration that the presidential campaign is roughly around a 90-day uh, campaign at the most, at the slow period of uh, uh, gubernatorial activities, uh, I think it's wrong to insist or even to, to ask uh, that the governor uh, resign and to, you know, it's an embarrassing question. And I don't like to see it happen. I like to see uh, the opposition to the Republican ticket be based on the philosophy that it reflects on the programs uh, that they want to sponsor. And uh, as a Democrat, I want to oppose the ticket on that basis and not on the, on the basis of, this, uh, of these kinds 
uh, of requests. Well, it's an amazing thing about uh, this. Uh, of all the criminals who are apprehended, only 1% is incarcerated. So an awful lot of people are uh, getting into difficulties and not uh, accepting eventual justice. One of the great things about Martin Luther King, who uh, was an advocate of uh, civil disobedience, is that he was prepared to accept the legal consequence. This was a part of his, uh, of his moral crusade. And uh, I have, the, the, for those who believe that way, uh, then they, I suppose, should act that way. For myself, I still want to believe that a democratic country is quite different from a totalitarian one, that we have the processes and the procedures available to correct all injustice. Uh, well, we are comms and trying to comms this here to, to just to show one part of the city being cleaned up by our organization. Uh, we have about 16 girls and we have about 16 boys that work this area from time to time. Uh, well, I'm speaking of Mr. M Evermore have fell on his job to send us the city sanitation, the city building inspector, uh, the whole work of the city has fell to sleep on their job. We find that sometimes garbage men come by and uh, they don't take all the garbage, they leave some behind. Then we the neighbors have to get together and clean it up and put them in the boxes. And then when they come by again, the users don't take them. And we have to uh, pay them sometimes to take up the rest of the trash that they leave behind. So you have to contribute something to them, yes. And yes. what do you mean by that? Money. You have to pay them. Pay the individual driver and the collector himself? Pay the boys that are handling the, uh, the luggage. What do you have to pay them? Well, you can give them 50 cents, a dollar, anything you have, just that they'll accept, and then you get to stuff and you know, time it. Uh, the trash collection is being made regular, but if you have your cans in your backyards and uh, the settler and uh, you uh, take and uh, try to keep a clean yard, the building inspector come out, they tell you you have to get a, a new garbage can with a tightly fitted ledge on it. Uh, they don't want to take your garbage. They don't want to take it. Why? They don't want to take it. I do not know why. Have you ever had to pay the uh, the Baltimore City Sanitation Department to have it, uh, the trash removed? Yes, we have. How much? We take them a dollar or fit cents is what we have, you know, at the time. And this is for over and above the normal amount of trash? Yes, uh-huh. And that's certainly what they leave behind. And uh, what the garbage men don't take, and when the truck come through, they sweep the alley up so far, and then sometimes they skip the other part of the yard alley's going down. The thing that causes the greatest regrets is finding a place to make your bets. <laughs> Where will the oaks go? The bets are phony. To shout, take it off, or sock it to me. The block could move and be a sensation at McKelvin's Indian Reservation. <laughs> In Washington, congressmen would be gay with a place to spend their extra pay. Really, it all was done without malice, replacing Blaze Star with Pomeroo's Palace. <laughs> None of unwritten law, it's written law that uh, on the, in the rules uh, that you do not uh, attack councilmen uh, for the sake of attacking a councilman. We have exchanges in the council and I think that's the way it should be. But a personality clash between councilmen where one councilman would harangue another, uh, I just, I'm not going to allow that. I don't think it's proper on the floor of the council. Uh, all of the councilmen, by the way, have abided by this as long as I can remember. There are heated exchanges between councilmen and there should be. 
at a personality uh, exchange on the floor, I see serve, serves no purpose and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, would not be tolerated. Uh, uh, when you have debates, when you have discussions, uh, difference of opinion, that's one thing. But to malign another councilman on the floor, uh, uh, that I don't think is proper. Would a resolution be considered in that category? No, uh, it was an entirely new situation, situation that we'd have to uh, study. Uh, a discussion of the resolution in, in that light, I don't think would be in the same category as discussing uh, or maligning a councilman on the floor. I think it would be entirely different. It would be a resolution that would have to be looked at and read as the resolution is introduced. Fear is a big thing on both sides of the fence. Um, we encounter it with people who perhaps start out uh, in looking in traditionally old white areas and perhaps through some fear of their own, uh, they don't quite go all the way. Um, we have to learn to uh, market like we did to the white person after World War II. Uh, after World War II, the builders and developers had to entice whites into the suburbs. The same needs to be done with the Negro. We, ne we need to go out and, and uh, market our product to the black man the same way we do to the white man. No difference. As far as elected officials are concerned, an entire situation that's differentiated by the city solicitor. The, I have no intention and do not envision uh, a resolution in the council to uh, ask or suspend either Councilman Mock or Councilman DePietro. If one were introduced, what action would follow? It would be handled in the usual way as any other resolution. Uh, uh, it would either be referred to a committee or I'd consider it as a, in the committee of the whole. I haven't, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't anticipate or I haven't uh, seen any resolution of that nature uh, being prepared so far. Uh, but right now, uh, if it is introduced, we will handle it uh, in accordance with the regular administrative procedures of the council. If it were introduced, what committee would get it? You're asking me something that I haven't considered before, and I think uh, if it were introduced, rather than place any of the council committees uh, in the position of having to make a determination, the responsibility, I think, would be mine. I would convene the committee uh, uh, the council is a committee of the whole to uh, act upon such a resolution.
the background to get him in here. And the idea is to see where the student movement is going today. And this is not uh, an endorsement, necessarily, of the tactics used at Penn State. It's something in an intellectual search. Seeing that this school is, is loaded for people who are rather complacent intellectual. What are you doing here? <laughs> Every man in Baltimore City owns teams, is willing to cooperate. Everyone is willing to put rent from the city. They will give you sufficient facilities that you want. Well, where, do, where does it all stand now? I mean, where, it stands what? right now. It's depending on what the city councilman is going to do. Well, if, if, if they say you just can't do this... We uh, have to get the team there. Where are we going to place them? There's men out of work. In this school, how, how many men? It's around with five or six hundred men that would be thrown out of work. It's number one. It's no work into the United States Employing Agency. I called there. I explained it to Mr. Roy. Now, I try to get in contact with the uh, uh, a job court. They are no longer here. All right, now what is we going to do with these people? The welfare don't want them, and this is the poor people's livelihood. Well, they say that uh, this, this presents a sanitary problem. Uh, I, I believe they've told you that, the, the horses. Yeah. Well, you, you have a stable right, uh, right back of here, don't you? That's right. I have a stable in the rear of 1700 block of East Preston Street, and my stable is a whole lot cleaner than the yards there. For two years, I got one particular yard there I've been trying to get cleaned out for two years. We've had city men out there, and they come out, they write down different things they say they're going to get done, and they haven't been done. And for two years, this haven't been done. Now, I, we don't intend to uh, try to uh, keep these horses in here to antagonize people. If the city would do their part and clean up, I'm sure that we can do our part. The sign says, welcome. But that could all be meaningless after tonight when Gwyn Oak Park turns its lights out and closes its 75th season this evening. It could mark the end of an era. A time in history which gave us the amusement parks, Tallchester Park, Seaside Park, Riverview Park, Old Bay Shore, Glen Echo, and yes, Gwyn Oak Park. Well, Gwyn Oak Park is 75 years old and the only park of all those I mentioned left today. But all that could come to an end, perhaps, after this evening. All of those parks are gone today, that is, all except for Gwyn Oak Park, which still remains. But there are those who are here today who may not realize it. They could very well be part of the last crowd to enjoy the attractions of a Maryland amusement park. Gwyn Oak Park is near bankruptcy today, brought about by a series of unfortunate incidents which have plagued the park for the past 10 years. While Gwyn Oak is alive today with youngsters of all ages, it has never really been the same since the summer of 1963, when the arrest of hundreds of demonstrators seeking to break down the park's segregation lines gained national publicity but caused losses it has never been able to recoup. <laughs> 10 years ago, churches, schools, and industry accounted for nearly 250 outings every summer, particularly on weekdays when business otherwise would have been slow. This summer, there were less than 50 group-sponsored outings at the park. <laughs> Not all the attractions in the park were aimed for the youngsters. There were also appealing interests for the adults. The Dixie Ballroom, which in the 30s and 40s echoed the big band sounds of the Dorseys, Artie Shaw, Glenn Miller, Louis Prima and others has gone 17 years since the dance there was last open to the public. And the private parties so prevalent there in the past are also disappearing. 
Although there have been no racial incidents in the past three years, Park President David Price blames the park's declining appeal on a fear by white people to integrate and the lack of consistent support from blacks. Sometime next month, a decision will be made, a decision whether to open the park next year on a full-time basis, on weekends only, or not at all. Whatever the outcome might be, the sad part is that a diversion which for so many years has meant so much to so many people may be passing us by. time has gone by and believe me I'm certainly going to be active I have no intention of sitting in the grandstands and watching the parade go by I will be on the ball field playing the political ball field that and business I have my own business affairs but for 18 years I've held public office in Maryland I've thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, to the extent I can be active believe me I will might you be interested in the uh, chairmanship of the Democratic Party of the state of Maryland well, I've been a Democrat uh, for all my working life, and I'm very proud of the Democratic Party. But who the chairman will be will be up to the Democratic State Central Committee, and I think we should wait to see uh, what they decide. Can I get you to say that you will be a candidate in 70 for one of the offices uh, up for grabs? Well, I shouldn't think I would be a candidate for political office in 1970. It's well known that I have the very greatest respect for uh, the governor of Maryland and for my former colleague in the Senate, Joe Tidings. Are you saying that you will not be a candidate for public office in 1970? Well, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't think there was an office available that I would run for in 1970. So we'd have to look ahead to uh, 72. Well, we might have to look a long way into the future. 74. Who knows? train these youngsters and by youngsters of course you're getting into the early 20s too uh, to so they can hold down a job and have the skills so everybody's ahead mr. secretary I wanted to thank you and through you the entire Navy Department for your help in Camp Concern and I know I speak for all of us in Baltimore and in the uh, Baltimore municipal government who have a part in Camp Concern that the best testimonial that you can give us is to continue the program here at Bainbridge, but to also have this thing repeated throughout the country, where you can have 
the military definitely involved in the urban problems. And what better way is reflected by Camp Concern is providing health, recreational outlets during the summertime. I think the staff of Camp Concern would be more than pleased uh, if this thing could be repeated. That would be the, the greatest gift back to them. Uh, I don't understand what prompted the police commissioner, Commissioner Pomelo, to voice uh, those kinds of comments, other than any department head, when his budget is reduced, feels aggrieved. Uh, but I don't think that the treatment that he's received by the city council warrants that kind of criticism that he rendered. And the proof of the matter lies in the fact that uh, not too many years ago, roughly about three to four years ago, the police budget was at $26 million. And today the police budget is at $54 million, more than doubled. And I think that speaks for the kind of treatment that he's received uh, as far as uh, the municipal government is concerned. Do you think this kind of a statement could be uh, damaging? It doesn't, any, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good because you have to submit other budgets to the same council. And what good are you going to accomplish, especially when you are the beneficiary of almost a doubling of your budget since you've been here, by attacking an agency that has to oversee, a legislative body that has to oversee your expenditures. It doesn't make sense. We are in a race with change, and I am determined that it will not be a collision course. We have been told that we are polarized, radicalized, and ostracized. Black against white, suburbanite, suburbanite against city dweller, young against old, hard-headed father against hard-headed son. I, for one, refuse to believe that these differences are irreconcilable. Virgin, who has been the real beneficiary of the American dream, I consider the governorship of Maryland to be the most important office in this nation. And I ask each of you, who might have had even a lesser share of that dream, to reflect upon those among us who have had no share of it at all. This is why I want to continue working with you and for you and for Maryland. And this is why I'm announcing today that I am a candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor of Maryland. Thank you very much. Because of the way it's been handled, I'm hearing some awfully vicious rumors of, about Dr. Koch, and I think it's one of the most unfair things I've ever seen done in my life. And I think the school board ought to come out and make a direct charge against this man, if indeed they have any reason to fire him. Because I'm getting a little tired of being blamed for it. And some of the rumors I've heard about this man just can't possibly be true, and I don't believe them. And I think because they, of the manner in which they handled it and haven't charged him with some violation uh, for which he could be fired. They have created a horrible situation where this man is being absolutely maligned, uh, viciously, uh, beyond imaginations. Uh, some of the things that I've heard said about him, the reason that people are speculating on are just absolutely uh, horrible. And I think the school board or the board of trustees of community colleges should immediately clarify this situation, and I'm going to so advise him today. Are you then in accordance with Mr. Bartenfelder's request for a blue ribbon investigation? Under the circumstances, I have to be in accord with it. Something should be done about this situation because many of the students, many of the parents, and many people that are just interested in good education are blaming me for this situation. 
over which I have absolutely no control or no authority. Uh, and neither does Council B Councilman Bartenfeller or Senator Pine or any of the rest of us for that matter, but we're all interested in seeing people treated fairly and uh, I think this has been an outrage uh, the way it's been handled. pretty effective. I think we're getting to a lot of people and, and mainly getting people to talk to us and express their views. And a lot of people will find out that, that we're not we're not as quite as as radical as they might think, that, that we really do have some valid views to express. One of the principal contentions of the defense and perhaps the main reason why the trial of Rap Brown has been so frequently moved and so often delayed, is that Brown would not be safe being tried in a state court. It was violence in Bel Air and Cambridge that accompanied one stage of the pre-trial proceedings and that led to the removal of the trial from Bel Air to Ellicott City. This old hillside mill town seems an unlikely place, though, for violent events, even though one local newspaper refers to Howard Countians as being apprehensive about the trial. The winding, steep main street with its quaint antique and art shops reassures the casual observer that, if nothing else, Ellicott City is a peaceful small town, the residents of which would have been delighted if the federal court had taken jurisdiction of the case. There is little sympathy for the defendant here. Ellicott City residents that I talk with believe the legal maneuvering with the changes in venue and costly police protection are a burden on the taxpayer. There are few black faces here. Howard County's Negro population is only 8%, compared with some 30% in Cambridge, where the disorders of June 1967 led to the arson and riot charges against Brown. But two federal courts have refuted the defense claims about the potential danger to their client, as well as the change in racial composition from Dorchester to Howard County, and decided that Brown can get a fair trial here in a state court. And unless the Supreme Court agrees to hear the defense petition for federal jurisdiction, Rap Brown must go on trial in the courthouse here on Monday. This is Christopher Gall, Eyewitness News in Ellicott City, Maryland. I think those charges are so ridiculous that it doesn't even or shouldn't even be dignified by an answer. In the first place, there was a state police car not far from the scene when this happened that was there minutes after the happened. Secondly, there were eyewitnesses that saw the explosion. Thirdly, there is no evidence of any sort from any agency indicating that there was another person in the car. They, I, I just think that these uh, kind of statements are made for the purpose of possibly inflaming public opinion but there is no substance whatsoever. Mr. Kunstler feels that we're in the same situation as we were in in Harford County. Mr. Bender, do you really think that the, uh, this case will ever really come to trial in Maryland, anywhere? 
We don't know. Have you, have you discussed it or talked about it at all? Well, we need Mr. Brown before we can have a trial. And we, no one has been in touch with him. He hasn't been in touch with us. Well, uh, again, a speculative question, but do you think that Mr. Brown would feel any better or any worse uh, about going to Ellicott City than he would about going to Bel Air? I don't know. When do you expect to hear from him? We have no idea. We haven't heard from him. Uh, I can only reiterate, reiterate what Mr. Kunstler said. He could be alive, he could be dead. The last time we heard from him was March 6th, and we haven't heard a word from him since then. Do you or Mr. Kunstler or any of your associates feel perhaps that Mr. Brown might tend to get a, a fair trial with an all-black jury and perhaps a black judge rather than a, a mixed or all-white jury? Yes, more acceptable than... Uh, we feel that a black man cannot get a fair trial in this country today. Unless the Supreme Court intervenes, the trial of H. Rapp Brown will return Monday to this somber-looking courthouse here in Ellicott City. Pre-trial proceedings had begun here last week, but were suspended when defense lawyers tried to get the federal court in Baltimore to assume jurisdiction of the case. That attempt failed yesterday when a three-judge panel of the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that neither Brown's safety nor his civil rights would be threatened in a state court as the defense charged they would be. However, William Kunstler, Brown's attorney, indicated that he would go to Chief Justice Warren Burger in Washington to ask him to stop the move back to Ellicott City so that the Supreme Court can review the appeals court decision. If Mr. Kunstler fails, then all his appeal procedures at this point will have been used up, and his client will have to stand trial before Judge James McGill and a Howard County jury. The Ellicott City trial has been called for Monday, and since all the pre-trial motions have been dealt with, the actual trial will begin then, and the defendant must be present. So far, in all the changes of venue and appeal hearings, Brown's presence has not legally been required. He is free on $10,000 bail, the amount set after his indictment in August 1967 on common law charges of arson and riot stemming from disorders in Cambridge, Maryland a month earlier. Brown was last seen March 8, the day before his trial began in Bel Air, Maryland. It had been moved there from Dorchester County at the request of the prosecution and then moved a second time to Ellicott City after prosecutors objected to publicized comments about the trial by Harford County Judge Harry Dyer. Mr. Kunstler says he doesn't know where his client is, although he indicated he might show up if the trial were to be held in federal court. However, Mr. Kunstler said he would not advise his client to appear for a state trial because Mr. Kunstler asserted he didn't think Brown would be safe. This is Christopher Gall, Eyewitness News, at the Ellicott City Courthouse. In today's hearing, lawyers for Rat Brown again argued that their defendant is being deprived of a fair trial in Maryland. Defense counsel William Kunstler insisted that the three trial removals from Dorchester to Harford and then to Howard County were accompanied by a reduction in the black population of those counties and that under the terms of an 1866 civil rights law, brown civil rights are being violated. Mr. Kunstler also contended that an atmosphere of violence has surrounded the state pre-trial proceedings and that his client wouldn't be safe in Maryland courts. He said a Howard County newspaper already has revealed hostility and that there have been three bomb threats in connection with the Brown trial that was suspended in Ellicott City last Tuesday. The state argued that Mr. Kunstler is playing games and abusing the appeal procedures. Deputy Attorney General Robert Sweeney noted that Mr. Kunstler rejected an offer of state police protection for himself, his client, and his associates. Mr. Sweeney has declined public comment so far about the case, but Mr. Kunstler seemed pleased with today's hearing. It was an argument. Both sides argued. The court has certain questions. I thought some of the questions seem to favor our position, and I hope that I'm right. What would be the best outcome that you could look for? Would you have an entry hearing, or do you want to just an absolute transfer to the court? Well, I think the best outcome for us would be an absolute transfer to the federal court. But however, an evidentiary hearing would be very proper, and we would certainly welcome it. Mr. Kunstler, at one point today, the prosecution suggested that you be asked in court whether or not you've had any contact or communication with 
Atrap Brown since March 8th. What would your answer have been? My answer would have been no, I have not. Mr. Sweeney seemed to indicate that you're displaying uh, semantic games, that uh, maybe not at this moment you don't know where he is, but uh, that you actually know his whereabouts. The prosecution has consistently taken the point of view that we know something about Rap Brown's whereabouts that we're not disclosing. We have tried in every way possible to indicate that we do not know, that we don't think his wife knows, and that everybody else we've spoken to doesn't know. We've tried to be honest and fair about it, though I guess we're just talking into the, the blizzard, because I guess people will say, no, they must know. This is the prosecution. We do not know. This is Christopher Gall, Eyewitness News at the Baltimore Federal Courthouse. Certainly for his next few years, if he continues to remain in Algeria, of course, if he leaves and goes to some other country where we do have good relations on, and good extradition uh, agreements, uh, or if he should return to the United States, then, of course, he would be subject to trial, and limitations would not run as long as he's outside the state of Maryland. You mean he could be tried 20 or 30 years uh, from now? Theoretically, he could be tried 50 years from now. That's right. Yeah, I think Mr. Broge and I are eminently satisfied. I have the order here which Judge Winter has just signed, which he has granted the stay until Monday, April 27th, or as further directed by the court after argument on the appeal. And this order was just signed moments ago by the court. And I think Mr. Broge can speak for himself. I feel very happy that it was granted, and I think that it was a substantial issue, and we'll argue it fully on Monday. We came down to talk to you. Talk to everybody who said on the street. The words that have people talk back. So come on out to do that. I want to hear from you who wants to talk to you. We have no other choice. The power structure is here in court. You see the police around here. What we want to do is hold the police. Uh, we can't get permits anymore. We couldn't leave the bank today. We can't go anywhere in the street. Mayor hey, Delisando made a speech last night, and he made it clear that the peace demonstrators this this city wouldn't be allowed to do anything legally. I have, I have never met a communist, and I have enough faith in my own intelligence. So, but better than you met the communist, then you find out what's going on over there. I know I have in my I know. I'm not, I'm not trying to support Russia. See, I'm not trying to support any communist country. I'm saying this is a peace movement and not a communist movement. If there are communists in the group and they're socialists, the conservatives, liberals, that doesn't make a difference. As yeah, long as you're for peace. You like to change then, everything here. No, we don't want to change everything. We just want to change certain things, certain priorities in this country. Where 66 percent of our of the, of the budget is spent on defense, and milit on military research is, is very very costly, and like money spent on health programs is That's is right. But listen, when they, when you stop the war in Vietnam, yes, how many million people you got without a job? Oh, see, that's the least. I mean, then what happened after World, World War II? After World War II, the prosperity of this country never was so great. Yeah, how many so. million uh, people met out of job you are here in the United States? Oh, we should, we, we should. Millions. In this millions. See, but after World War II, the United States industry has proved itself capable of rechanneling it, its its wealth to constructive measures and, and to change it from a defense-based industry to a people-based industry. We can, now if we can rechannel this money, Raise the salaries of our police force, raise the salary of teachers, raise the salaries of sanitation men, and improve our environment, get rid of the ghetto so we're a couple of blocks away from here.
majority of the students who voiced their objection as far as uh, the government's policy are concerned have to be separated from this group of thugs. There's one group of thugs who are out to, to beat up people, to rob people, to terrorize people. It's a very small minority and they have to be dealt with with the full strength of the law. On the other hand, I think the great majority of the student dissent has been, based on the experience here in Baltimore, relatively peaceful. And it's, it's really a shame that a small core, even in that group, may tie up a street and therefore cast a reflection on their contemporaries, because really that they, they do not reflect the general thinking of the students. Uh, we expect to um, have Dr. Merritt's report in hand within the next two weeks. Uh, I don't think I want to discuss precisely when he's leaving uh, or precisely um, when he's coming back because quite frankly I would as soon insulate the doctor from press or public inquiry. He's doing this for the government. Uh, we will report to the court um, and I'm not anxious to have him frankly besieged by reporters. Well, um, Mr. Brewster is in Ireland in a hospital. Uh, his attorneys have uh, represented to the court in the District of Columbia that he is presently suffering from a neurological condition uh, that makes uh, it impossible for him presently to appear for arraignment and to stand trial. Uh, the government has been furnished with additional uh, medical detail in support of that claim. We have determined to uh, send to Ireland for the purpose of a, a thorough examination of Mr. Brewster and of the claim. Uh, a very eminent uh, a neurologist, the Dr. Houston Merritt of the Columbia Medical School and formerly with the <coughs> Neurological Institute in New York, um, Dr. Merritt will conduct whatever medical examination he thinks is appropriate and will report to us. and. Um, our future course will be guided, of course, by uh, what, uh, what report we get. Well, I, now the uh, Department of Justice is reviewing uh, the question of appeal, pre precisely which route of appeal is now available to them. Um, I believe it is likely, A, that they will appeal, and B, it may very well be that they can appeal directly to the Supreme Court and uh, skip one step in the process by voiding the Court of Appeals, go right up to the top court. Are there any other alternatives, such as a uh, congressional action to change uh, the congressional immunity uh, provisions? Well, if I understand Judge Hart's opinion, uh, it would take a uh, constitutional amendment of the so-called speech and debate clause uh, in order to remove the immunity which currently exists, uh, in, his, in his opinion. Uh, and, of course, the Supreme Court still has to answer the question whether Judge Hart's right or not. Well, just how far can one stretch the intent of the congressional immunity provision? Well, in the course of the argument, uh, perhaps this is the best example, uh, the question was asked of defense counsel, uh, 
if a legislator were to receive $10,000 from someone in return for his vote on a particular measure, uh, did it mean that he could not be prosecuted, that the legislator could not be prosecuted for that? Uh, and the defense counsel's answer was yes, that's what, in effect, they were arguing. Now, uh, when the government had its turn to argue, it, it argued that uh, if this is correct, that a legislative official in the federal, in the federal government, uh, when he is performing a legislative act, has, in effect, a license to steal. Uh, and uh, that gives you an idea, that hypothetical, I think, gives you an idea of really how far uh, the blanket of immunity goes.